What's up, everybody? Today we are going deep into shoulders, posture. We're going to talk a little bit about tendinopathy and uh, a lot of things just really about performance and how you can better yourself. Uh, we got Phil here for Physio Friday. Here we go. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. All right, Tribe, uh, it's good to be back. Uh, my name is Yanni Bormeister. If we haven't met, uh, along with Rad and Richard, we are the founders of Unity Gym in the UMS. And uh, it's Friday, so I have my great friend, Phil White, a.k.a. Switched On Physio. And the reason why he is switched on, because he is one of the best. How are you going, mate? Good. Nice to be here. It's really exciting being in the gym. Um, it was really nice walking into the gym and having like the black p plastic off the windows there's sunlight in the gym again it's just things it feels like things are looking up things are looking up that's the right virus is still very much at large <laughs> <laughs> that's right as long it as feels nicer as long as sunlight. we don't spread it around too much in the protests on the weekend uh that, that, that we're about to have then we should be okay to open again we'll yeah. see i don't want to be too controversial yeah <laughs> but no it's been a good week please be here i'm feeling a bit worse for wear after um falling off my mountain bike a few times now i'm getting back into it hitting the manly dam trails got all the way up to like the top of this um sandstone uh kind of little mini cliff that i'd ridden up but my gears don't go down to the lowest gear so i got to the top and then just couldn't get over this tiny little rock that was my way and then fell backwards off a cliff and just smashed my arm up against a um oh, <laughs> against a rock so feeling a bit sore leaning on my arms here on this beautiful table but yeah you know, it's, well. uh, been a good week and I'm yeah, keen to be suck it up. <laughs> suck it up. Love a bit of mountain biking. Um all oh, right. Well look, we've got a couple of really cool things to talk about. Now the main topic of discussion that came through uh in a personal email to Phil, so I can't build context around that. I'm gonna let Phil do that himself. Um, in regards to a shoulder issue. We've also had um Probably one of the most common things that people talk, um, ask us questions about, which is usually medial or lateral epicondyle. Um, it's almost, almost medial. Medial, like, you think, well, yeah. It's, yeah, it, it really seems to be related to like the grip work that you know, all of these keen bean calisthenics um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, unity members seem to um, love so much. And it, yeah, so it's really. So this it, one was medial epicondylitis, which yeah. is, uh, of course, uh, golfer's elbow, aka um, tendinopathy yeah. in the. Usually the epicondyle. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. Yes, medial epicondyle is the inside of your elbow here, and that's a really common place because it's your um, sort of flexor tendons, which is really involved with with grip and pulling. So, um, another question that that one came through from Alan Zuckerman, and um, I did kind of address it a little bit on my own little show yesterday, and um, we'll have a quick chat about it. But I think because it, it is a topic that we talk about so often that we'll um, maybe direct you just to some, some past resources. discussions. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. We don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of tendinopathy again today because it's a it's a hot topic and yeah. we talk about it but a lot. Excited like, uh, with a new project that I'm working on with um, exercise rehab programs, going to be putting together a um, yeah a medial epicondyle with um, my new business uh, partner. So yeah, that's going to be our out. first project. So yeah. um, we'll be getting plenty of good stuff out there for you. Awesome. To, uh, be good, stuff. On. good stuff. Good uh, stuff. Okay. So um, very quickly, we've got a couple of people on the live stream. As you guys know, if you're listening on the Sound of Movement podcast or watching the replay on YouTube, uh, we do stream these uh, live to our UMS Movement Mastermind private Facebook group. Anyone can join as long as you agree to abide by the code of conduct. Uh, jump on over to Facebook, search for UMS Movement Mastermind. We've got Aidan Potts, Craig Jenkins, Jada. Thank you very much, Jada. It is good to be back. I'll beat a little bit uh, of a voice change while I get over this uh, chest thing. Uh, but yeah, it is good to be back. Yeah, and, and thanks um, Aiden for getting a question in there early. Um, we would love some questions today because I've been kind of uh, answering a lot of the physio questions on my own little 3 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time show. So um, yeah, we could really, we'd love to, we have plenty of time to answer your questions and this week's is a good one to ask them. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to finish Aiden. So stick around because I'm going to finish um, talking about your question specifically because I have a very, very personal experience with posture correction uh, after sort of 16 years of boxing and just all around bad posture growing up. So um, 
Uh, stick around to the end because that's going to tie in after our discussion on shoulders. So why don't we get started just quickly dipping our toe into the tendinopathy uh, rabbit hole. Okay. And yep. uh, and we'll, we'll get through that real quick and then we'll get into our shoulder discussion today. Yes, this one came through from a new member on the UMS Mastermind group called um, Alan Zuckerman. He says he's a 55-year-old uh, athletic fit with chronic medial elbow pain that is ongoing for at least eight months now. Obvious injury that started from various uh, assisted simple pulling routines from the rings. I've tried resting the elbow for some weeks and various uh, daily physio exercises as well over the months, but nothing has worked. No real pain to speak of, daytime and nighttime. Um, when I'm working out, my screen's going crazy, hang on. Um, however, I immediately get pain, any kind of pulling exercises, push-ups, hanging from a bar, and instant um, pain. For example, if I extend my arm, lay my hand flat in the wall, and try and push away with my fingers. Uh, with really no body weight pushing its wall. Um, the origin seems to be the finger tendons. I work out almost daily, generally body weight, flexibility stuff, and yoga. The pain is always right at the tendon insertion point at the elbow, nowhere else. Um, my wrist flexibility is good, and I do plenty of wrist strengthening exercises. I never go past a four, max five out of 10 um, when working out pain, and the pain goes away within an hour of working out. Any help appreciated. All right. Um, so that's a yeah good amount of information to work from. Again, just remember that with these Physio Friday shows, like this isn't a consultation, so I can't formally diagnose. So we're just working off the assumption that um, you know that you have the diagnosis. You do right. in fact <laughs> <laughs> have medial elbow tendinopathy. Yeah. So um, and this is general information for you to um, you know quick work disclaimer. With. <laughs> but yeah, it's not a specific um, exercise prescription or yeah, we're not. You're not in my care as a as a physio, um, but yeah, the things to kind of point out from um, this particular case is that it, you know when it's when it's got to the point where it's going for eight months, um, that's a sign that it's generally it's like going to be harder to get out of this because if it's been only been there for a short time, it's quite likely that you'll be able to get rid of it fairly quickly. But the longer it sort of sticks around, it j you've just got to get in that mindset that it's probably going to take a bit longer. The more time to get that the collagens that. and the protein have had time to break down. And, yeah. And, and, and I mean, and part of it is the like morphological changes in, so basically like the actual like um, changes in the structures of the body, but also, um, you know, with pain science, it's more than just those morphological changes. It's, it's so much about, you know, your association now with pulling is that like before you go to you know, do any pulling now, you're going to be a bit worried and that threat, like that yep. perceived threat is going to then increase any type of signal that you get from that area, which is going to amplify the then pain you feel. So it's, uh, it's more can, than... Can, can we just stop for a second? I want you guys to really take a moment to just digest what Phil said, because it's a huge insight, a huge insight for anyone who's ever been injured and anyone who's suffering from any sort of injury or pain at the moment. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically, like with, um, it's very tempting to always just think about when, what's when happening an injury in the body. Been going for a long yeah. time. This when, is more specific too. Yeah, I think. exactly. So with um, all that we've talked about with pain science um, in previous shows, um, basically we know that there's a big, uh, like the brain is 100 percent the thing that is experiencing pain and the things that uh, influence that pain is the signal that you're getting from your body but also how you're processing it and pain can kind of be summarized as perceived threat so if you've had an injury that's very um, entrenched and has been there for a long time then you sort of start to get that like you know you can kind of catch yourself where you when you go to do a thing that you know has hurt you in the past you're now going to be expecting that pain and that's going to be amplifying basically any signal that you're getting from that area so 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 let's i just want to break that down for the people who don't understand the, um as much about pain science what phil's suggesting there is that it's not he's not saying that you're not injured or there's not uh, an issue there that needs to be dealt with and you should just ignore it what he's saying is because of the the the, the, the pre previous history and how long it's been going on for it kind of almost has its own pathway where it amplifies the pain much more than you should really be and feeling just it. to be really specific yeah it, it like what's happening is you're amplifying the signal which the is signal. not not a pain signal but a information signal from that area which then is processed and is expressed as pain it's so expressed so as you're still more pain than there's, there should be yeah so it's not like you're turning up and down the pain at the source you're getting the same signal but then what your brain processes comes as as pain yeah. and so the, the important distinction there is that um it's not something that you can if you just change what's happening in the elbow, that doesn't mean that it'll change the pain. It's if you um, sort of rub the area or whatever, you um, uh, do these sort of, I've been talking a bit about diffuse noxious inhibitory control, which is when why it feels better to 
um, if you hit your head to like rub it a bit because you start like blurring that signal. So basically you can kind of cloud that signal and then the body doesn't process the pain as much. I have a question because I've always wanted Love to know questions. what this, what this, you know, I've seen people before and I've seen them sold at chemists for, te for tennis and golfer's elbow. You can get those straps that yes. strap around the forearm and there's like a little um, plastic thing that presses mm -hmm. into a part that you choose to um, focus on. What is ha what is that? What why? What's, yeah, so what, how is that helping? Because people often say, "Oh, it helps when I use this strap." You know. Yeah, I think it kind of comes down to two things. So, um, generally, what we do with it is you put it just below the area of pain. Yeah. Um, so, in this case, with the medial elbow, um, that's the attachment site for your um, wrist flexor tendons. Um, so, what you're doing is by putting it slightly below, applying a firm pressure it's almost like it's changing the origin site of that muscle. So now that muscle's kind of got um, now this sort of like stabilized point off the actual tendon so that when you're doing your flexion, now you're, in, it's like instead of this bony attachment, now you've got this like compressed muscular attachment, which is sort of changing the origin site almost. Yeah, um, right. Which because I think I, f I feel like there's a connection there. Some I'm trying to draw some sort of connection to this whole pain science but this, thing. Yeah, this is my second point. Is that like basically when you you know it's a very human natural, like animals do it. We all like if we hurt ourselves, we'll rub the area, we'll press the area, we'll do something because that's changing the signal that then is getting processed by our brain. And because we're we've got control over that signal by being able to change the pressure, doing that thing. Our the way our brain works is now that's not a threatening thing anymore because we're in control and that is why you're no longer feeling that kind of pain but when it's this you know you're getting all this signal that your brain's like oh why you know pulling is the devil yeah, <laughs> like yeah, pulling did yeah. this to me so i can't pull anymore then it's a lack of control that perceived threat is ramped up and therefore it's going to be um it's going to be stuck around for a bit longer so so could we tr draw a conclusion or, or use that as an example for the people out there who are trying to understand how this p pain science really works that you know strapping this thing around your wrist that that, do that does absolutely nothing around your forearm usually that does absolutely nothing to change the tissue or the injury it's not it's not reducing inflammation it's not um healing it's not creating a healing response it's kind of almost like distracting you from the injury well that's why i said there was kind of two parts to it part of it is that but also part of it is trying to biomechanically change the origin point of that okay. muscle to yep. change the amount of force it's then put in through there yeah, so right. that's why it can be a quite a useful tool for the short term for both of those um things to just you know allow you facilitate you to do the exercise but then you see those um you know those old blokes who walk around with that like the similar thing underneath their kneecap yep. forever and that's like they permanently yeah. wear that because that's like you know now that that's become like a, a crutch it's like a when people get put into orthotics identity, and they yeah. just keep wearing orthotics for their whole life or yep. Yep. you know um it's like it's a it, it should be used in the short term to facilitate loading and yep. then um stop yep. using it yep. <laughs> so, yeah perfect yeah uh yeah so hopefully that kind of all makes a bit of sense. Um, I know we went out in the weeds there a little bit, um, guys, but what I, the reason why I wanted to reinforce that point is um, to do with the fact that the wor one of the worst things to, that you can do when you get injured is to stop exercising. And it's very easy to do that because you have this instinctual, well, we've been programmed by our parents, by maybe our the prof healthcare professionals that we've um, uh, grown up with, that when you hurt yourself or you get sick, you need to rest. And... Um, and in many, many cases with an injury like tendinopathy, it's not the best course of treatment. The best course of treatment is to ad adapt your workouts to focus on the tendinopathy, not the goal that you had before. And it, often your goal has to ch sort of change a little bit. And that's where people fall over. People go, okay, I've got, I identify that I've got a tendinopathy, but I'm still going to go to the gym and train for my muscular hypertrophy or max strength goal and hope that the tendinopathy doesn't prevent me from yeah. achieving it. And that's where you have to get so like creative as a physio is to try and, because like you can give a tendinopathy program that, you know, is an, an optimal sort of one for a robot who is, doesn't have human nature <laughs> yeah. kind of in their ear. But if that perfect sort of program is not in line with that person's goals or you can't figure out a way of getting them buy-in, they're not going to do it. So yeah. um, 
I like to talk to people who have um, this particular issue and tell them, you know, now's a great time to focus on your legs. Now's yeah. a great time to focus on your, you know, that middle splits goal that you wanted. Yeah. And then just like do the work with your tendinopathy, get yeah. past that, and then start bringing back in the goals. And I think, uh, and, I'll, and I, I don't want to give him that much credit while he's um, stitched me up and, and made me take over the show for him this morning. But that is one of the things that um, Rad is remarkably good at doing mm. is pivoting. Very yeah. quickly. The moment he senses that there's an issue or an injury in his body, he's far superior at doing this than I am. Uh, he will pivot and you'll see him go and do a full shoulder rehab program. Sometimes too much, I think, you know, yeah, um, <laughs> he, he will do <laughs> like the robot I was six, to. eight yeah. weeks of a, a, a shoulder rehab program, yeah. despite his goal of doing a, um, a, 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 a planche or something, you know, and he's able to pivot his goal so quickly to, okay, I'm just going to focus on yeah. overcoming this issue. I know it's going to set my other goal back a few months, but I don't care because I know how bad this can get. And I do know a lot of people that do that really, really well. Yeah. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum which is me who just tries to push through until it basically floors me and m that's how i think most people probably go about things you know yeah so exactly. I, I, we won't go too um too much deeper on that um i just there's we got a lot a lot a lot of great resources on um uh, golfer's elbow on our yep. youtube channel even and phil's saying that he's developing a great program we'll keep you posted on that as well um, yeah, one thing that just with that, like, you know, focus your goals to maybe your lower body or something else, but t keep trying to train your upper body. Um, but you can use ways to, like he's pointed out here that things that really aggravate him is putting his arms out in the wall um, and then trying to push off with his fingers. And basically any when you go into that um, wrist extended position, like that's going to be stretching the joint and then trying to activate the joint from a stretch position we know is um, much harder than activating a neutral position. So I really recommend for people who are suffering with this issue to just try and ad adapt their wrist position. Cause I think you, you mentioned that there was, um, he thinks it's his finger flexors, which is right because a lot of people think like, oh, it's my elbow. For, so therefore it's like just my elbow pulling bicep curls, yep. um, pull ups, that kind of stuff. But really it comes down to what's happening in the wrist because they're the wrist muscles right. that are attaching up here. Yep. So um, by getting your wrist into neutral position. So you can, I like to recommend people who often, you know, people have those kind of like mini dumbbells that people use for like walking yep. along that used to be in all the rage in the yep, aerobics yep. days. The um, just those like dumbbells. little one or two kilo dumbbells are great to um, use as the, like especially if they're hex ones where they've got a nice stable surface, great for using to do push-ups. Yep. So um, if you can keep your wrist in that neutral position, that's just a way of like functionally deloading those um that particular um, structure while you can still heavily load the rest of your upper body, which, yep. um, and same with if you're doing pulling instead of being um, in supinated position and getting, um, you know, a good bicep pump, coming into that neutral position and just sort of changing things up a bit so you can um, start to share the load a bit. Yep. Now, very quickly, I've just, I just want to ch uh, check in with the comments that we've got here. Uh, Carmine is saying, back in the fold, you only with that. A painful pirate patch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so he's got the, uh, the moody like... black hat over the eyes. Yeah, yeah, there. that's right. <laughs> well, would like to hear Phil's opinion of wearing knee sleeves regularly. Um, Lee Clements, um, th th this goes back into sort of what we said before. I mean, if there's a specific reason for it, then... It might be okay. I've got lots of friends that wear knee and elbow sleeves just because they are lifting stupid amount of weight, which has a high probability of overuse injury or injury in, its, in and of itself. And that compression on the joint helps to mitigate that risk. Um, you could just want to have a really good reason. What, what are your take, well, takes I'm on it? I'm less worried about knee sleeves um, yep. because like the things that we have talked about quite a lot with like the, um, I guess in this example with the tendinopathy um, sort of uh, like compression uh, straps or orthotics, these are all biomechanically changing how that joint or structure works. Yeah. And it's kind of adding a crutch to that area that means that the structures that your body needs um, that, that are naturally there no longer have to work and they yep. become uh, weaker, they atrophy and you don't get the, um, you'll never get stronger because those are doing part of the job yep. and it means that you become really reliant on them if you take them away. Whereas the knee sleeve, not so worried. It's yep. not doing much. Yep. Like it's really not That's doing right. much. It's yeah. adding a, like a tiny amount of compression. Um, it's, you know, kind it's, of warming up your knees a bit. Like It's <laughs> almost more a placebo effect with knee sleeves. Like it, may, yeah. it does do a little bit, don't get me wrong. But if you ever see, if you've ever seen a power lifter, lift with um, compression straps, 
uh, oh, around yeah, the knee other. straps, <laughs> like they literally are in, in, in it's an excruciatingly painful. So if, and, and that certainly changes the game, yes. you know, that creates a lot of compression, a lot of stability yeah. and, and it changes the sheer shearing force in the knee a lot. Um, but what you need to understand is that the knee sleeves don't do that at all. You no. know, like the, it's, it's it, minuscule and, and I, um, uh, I don't really have a, much of a problem with it. I have my, my take on knee sleeves and compression and um, weight belts and everything. There is always inherently a risk when you lift heavy. You can't um, escape it, you know. The, the, and, and exercise, um, as much as I hate to admit it, exercising regularly at a very high intensity, you do suffer a, a level of wear and tear. I believe 110% that it is much better than not exercising. The, the types of um, de-evolving de that the body goes through, I don't know if I can say that as a word. I know devolving <laughs> is a word, but maybe the wrong use. Um, your body de-evolves, de devolves if you, it is a word, you can look it up. It, it is a word. Uh, it's not de-evolved. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so yeah, we weigh, weigh up that risk versus reward, and we choose yes, definitely exercising. And for me, lifting heavy is certainly something I want to do. But there is a, a, a wear and tear that your body has to um, deal with, and there is a risk. And so I choose. I, I am a strong believer that you should be wearing a weight belt when you lift heavy, and you should. Yeah, you, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with wearing knee sleeves and squat shoes. You know, lifters are another thing. People go, oh, you should squat bare feet. Well, yeah, squatting bare feet is very beneficial, but there's also benefits to lifting with squat shoes, you know, and um, uh, that's my take on it. Cool. Cool. Let's move on. Okay, shoulders. <laughs> Come on. We've only got like... That's five, ten minutes. Yeah. Um, and just on this, Jada's got a comment saying, I can relate to wearing a wrist uh, widget when I tore my TFCC a few months ago. I had to overcome the fact that my wrist was okay and I needed to start strengthening again. Yeah, that's exactly right. With Perfect. these things, they can just become a bit of a Perfect. crutch and people can yeah. really rely on it. And yeah. it's so important to, yeah, start getting out of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, can you build some context around shoulder with your email? I'm not not yeah. naming any names. Yeah, yeah. so this is um, from Paul. It's a private <laughs> email, so I won't go the full name, but I'll let him know that we've answered it here. Um, he says, he's been dealing with shoulder pain and hoping it gets better. Uh, went to a doctor, doctor and had x-rays. Uh, came back with a diagnosis of shoulder tendinosis, which is very interesting because you can't see tendons on an x-ray. Um, and <laughs> Sorry, repeat that again. I missed so that. he I says was... he went to a doctor and had an x-ray. It came back with his diagnosis of shoulder tendinosis, which I found really interesting because yeah, you can't right. see tendons on an x-ray. So You can only see bone on an x-ray, guys. Yeah. Um, so and I... maybe a bit of fluid water, but um, not yeah, so really. So you can see like changing of like joint space. So maybe he's making an assumption from the, like if he's got you know, a subacromial impingement, so sort of closing down of the space just below the top shoulder yep. bone in layman's terms, yep. um, that maybe that's kind of how he's got that diagnosis, but interesting. Uh, it says, assuming from years of painting ceilings above my head. Haven't had pain, uh, haven't painted in years, but the seal seems to count. Um, and he basically has a question about whether or not it's the front of the back of the shoulder from a previous podcast that we talked about. Uh, he says, honestly, I'm not sure, but the doctor didn't specify and it didn't really help me much um, and he didn't help me much except for send me to a massage, um, which COVID has now stopped. Uh, <laughs> and he says he's been doing the uh, shoulder rehab from Unity Gym. Which is which um, is the thing that uh, the sending to a massage is also a weird thing Yeah, to this do. doctor is wild. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there Sorry if he's a friend of yours. Yeah. Uh, and he's been doing some self-massage. And he says it feels um, more painful at the back of the shoulder. Uh, he's doing lots of scapular um, exercises from the Unity YouTube, um, and he thinks he's starting to gradually progress. Do you feel like it could be a gradual process, and am I okay to keep on training as he has been? Um, he has a whole bunch of other questions. Uh, sorry, comments here giving more context, but um, uh, there is, was one thing that I wanted to... Um, Oh yeah, that's what he says. He says, um, "Strange how years after painting, it all sudden, all of a sudden, um, seems to flare up, which is an important thing that I'll get to in a in a sec." Um, so, big picture sort of stuff here. Um, yeah, interesting that the doctor's saying go and get a massage, and I think that's probably for the you know trying trying to get that kind of postural benefit because when we've talked a lot about before, when you're trying to achieve overhead mobility, if you're in this sort of rounded posture, Aiden, we'll get to your posture question in a second um it is much harder um if you have 
rounded shoulders and your scapulas are, are somewhat winging to achieve overhead mobility because of the inefficiencies around the um, shoulder system in that stage because the rotator cuff can't control that um, the movement of the ball in the socket. So uh, I guess that's maybe why the doctor is saying massage. But the best way we can get past this is by building a shoulder system that functions really well. And the best way you can do that is with strengthening so and some mobility. Um, so that's kind of, with your question here about um, do you feel like this is a gradual process? Yes, yes. 100%. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 100 million percent. <laughs> yeah, you just And gotta... I'm going to have a field day with this in a moment when, when as soon as Phil's finished um, because it's something that I'm very passionate about. Yeah. But and, um, go on. Yeah, so we've, we've talked a lot about how, um, yeah, basically you have to embrace the process like and just keep chipping away. And the way that the Unity programs are designed is that it gives you a balance of um, strength and mobility and in all the different planes that you need. So that horizontal push-pull, vertical push-pull, um, and with the straight arm strength really uh, getting to those axioscapular muscles, so the muscles that control our scapula. So um, if you can be ticking off all those boxes, um, then that's going to be the way to go. Obviously, this can be a bit challenging for, um, he's saying he can't do the pike push-ups or pull-ups overhead um, because just overhead movement is not great. So we've talked a lot about before about trying to work within your available range and then um, build that available range as you go. Um, so a quick way that you can also help improve your overhead um, mobility instantly is just by getting better shoulder posture for it. So if you're trying to do your overhead work with your shoulders around like this, try doing some active hangs um, before you start off. So getting holding on, pulling your shoulders up, bringing your chest up and your shoulders back and down, and then try and really hold that position as you're doing your pushing and you're doing your pulling in that overhead position. And you'll uh, at least be starting from a, a stable and strong point. So that's a quick sort of thing you can try that can really help out. But um, if your shoulders really don't like overhead, then um, yeah, it's gonna be training your available range and do all the overhead mobility stuff in the shoulder rehab program. On this quickly before yeah, yeah. Uh, Yanni gets unleashed. Um, so <laughs> with t um, the diagnosis of shoulder tendinosis. So tendinosis, when you already see osis, that basically means like breakdown. Um, and that's what they used to call tendinopathies after they changed it from tendinitis into tendinosis. <laughs> now it's tendinopathy. But um, basically it's that idea of, it's almost like arthritis in your tendons is kind of how they explained it. Um, and so that's just why that word is different there. But now tendinopathy is um, what we call it. And the reason why sometimes you can have an issue flare up that seems really disconnected from um, you know your injury um, sorry your old history of painting so you know you're painting for years and years and years and years um, during that time you probably weren't doing a great shoulder strengthening <laughs> routine your shoulders were probably each time you were painting really working above their sort of threshold and, and, and had that sort of abusive load which kicks off the um, tendinopathy pathway so um, and you're probably getting that breakdown in the structure and if you were to scan your shoulders at that time with an MRI to see the tendon structure itself they probably looked pretty rubbish. Like that's one of the things that people get really confused about is when um, they're suddenly like looking at, that's why like doctors are often like, hey, you've got this change in your tendon, so this is the problem. When really that problem's been, like that change in the structure has been there for years. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's been there for, for years and years and years, has not caused a problem until suddenly something um, starts causing issues. And then you go in and get investigative, look at the structures in there and it's like, oh, that doesn't, Look, yeah. look clean so therefore that's the issue but really that um, even though it's not quite um, a perfect looking tendon it's been doing its job it hasn't been causing any pain whatsoever so it's just really important to understand that imaging does not equal pain yeah yeah and that that's, that's yeah that absolutely absolutely and that's something that, we, that it's a it's a, unfortunately something that we really um, as an untrained person rely on a lot mm. you know i used to be like the moment i had a little bit of pain i'd be like off to get an mri like yeah. literally i had a fucking tab card a discount card at the uh, f uh, at the radiology joint down the yeah. road you know yeah. um but i because i was always fascinated with what was going on um but yeah so it's so important that you don't use like imaging as 100 percent of your like especially if you you know if um, Paul gets in and gets stuck into his shoulder strengthening program. He really nails it, gradually builds up, gets to achieving overhead stuff, and then he goes back to that doctor and he goes like, oh, you know, is my doc like is my is my shoulder fixed? And then like, oh, we'll go have a, you know, we'll scan it again. Yeah. And it comes back being like, oh, 
Nah. No, yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> you still got you still got a messy looking tendon, but yeah, you know, and exactly therefore that right. starts to like change that mindset of the person, and there's something oh, go maybe I am weak, and maybe science rabbit hole. Exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. one thing that I just really want to make clear with tendinopathy is it's so important to understand that imaging does not equal yeah like the function and, and pain. Yeah, my and when I lie under a uh, or, or go into the the MRI tube, my body looks like I may as well just bury myself now. Like literally, like I'm I've got herniated discs i got like all sorts of crap going on throughout my spine i got um uh like last time i had an mri to give you an example guys last time i had an mri of of an unrelated issue it came back with a 16 millimeter tear in one of my rotator cuff muscles you know and and i was like jesus okay so that's why i'm experiencing that little bit of pain in my shoulder or whatever i had no clue that i was going to have a huge tear in one of my tendons you know um and I'm not suggesting that you discredit sh- scans at all, but just be yeah, careful so the how much. The thing you I really want to make clear with scans are their. Sorry, Rad's. Oh, jeez. Here we go. Sorry, Rad's distracting from, from downtown. Yeah. Just getting the show, mate. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the really key thing that I want to make people understand with scans is they are incredibly useful. They're really yeah. good when used appropriately but they should be used as a confirmatory diagnosis or screening for um, serious pathologies. So, you know, if you like suspect that maybe there's a tumor that's causing the pain and you can scan and be like, hey, that is a tumor. Like that is good information and scans are totally appropriate um, in many situations. And also with diagnosis, confirmatory, um, if, you know, as a physio, I I get someone come in and, um, you know, they tell me all these like how the injury happened, how it's been feeling since then, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, you know, it could be this structure, it could be that structure. Maybe go get a scan so we can really target your rehab. And and then the scan comes back and says like, it is in fact this one structure, not the other. Yep. Then that's a really good use of imaging where we can, um, where it's used appropriately. But if you just go to a doctor and you have a sore shoulder and they're like, don't ask you any questions. And they're like, okay, yeah. let's put you in a scan see what comes back. Then that's just... Like it can be misleading. Totally misleading. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Should I should I give you my experience with shoulders? Yeah. Go on. Um, so I'll try and keep this as as, as brief as possible. Um, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, and it's based on um, I don't know 20, 25 years of training experience personally on myself, and about sixteen or seventeen years of coaching other people. Uh, shoulders are the coolest joint. Uh, I love shoulders. They're so versatile. They're uh, uh, are capable of doing so many amazing things. Unfortunately, they're also, um, they can be a very, very vulnerable joint and a very, very strong joint depending on how you treat them. And a lot of that comes down to your posture. A lot of that comes down to the setup, the supporting structures around the shoulder. And I'm talking everything from gl- like feet to, to, to skull. You know, if you've got really bad uh, dysfunctional uh, crap going on in your lower body, it's usually going to be reflected in your upper body. And, uh, and therefore, you know, I really am a firm believer that if you're having issues in the shoulders, that, that you should just be focusing on becoming a really high functioning human everywhere. And slowly over time, it will sort itself out. The biggest problem is that if you have, uh, like, not, like so many of us, we don't grow up swinging from trees anymore. You know, there was just some pretty, um, pretty um, shocking data released uh, over the last couple of weeks that um, in the last 35 years, children can jump less high than they could 35 years ago. When, when Rad and I and Phil and everyone, we were kids, we could jump 1.5 meters. Now kids can only jump 1.3 meters because they're not exercising as much and they're losing muscle mass and they're- they um, not playing as much. They're not playing as much. This yeah. is the point, you know? I mean, they've almost banned monkey bars, you know? Yeah. And this is a really big problem because we are not getting the stimulation that I believe we need. And we're getting way too much of the wrong stimulus, which is where I'm going to tie this into Aiden's question about posture and sitting down for prolonged periods of time. Just to pause on that, like stimulation, like it's, it's more than just, you know, short term, like if the kids don't do it now, then they won't have it now. But if they train later, they'll get it back. Like when, if you look at sort of how bone growth and muscle growth um, happens over a lifetime, you have like a window. Yeah. <laughs> you have a window until you're about, um, you know, for different parts of your body and basically until you're about 30, um, 35 for like developing your bone and muscle mass. And then after that, 
It's just it's flatlining it's, and then dropping off. So. That's exactly right. You know, <laughs> the higher you can get your peaks early, the the better. Oh, the better. Yeah, and and that's why it's it's just so critical. And so you know, what I want to really reaffirm here is that if you've got shoulder problems and if you're experiencing sho- uh, uh, repetitive shoulder injuries, pain or something that you just really struggle to um, solve, and, and a lot of that is um, a, a great marker of that is um, overhead mobility. I know Phil's had issues with shoulders. I certainly have had issues with shoulders. There is a lot that can um, that can get in the way of a high functioning shoulder, and a lot of it um, is to do with your posture and the structures that support the shoulders around the shoulders, spine. Uh, sp- uh, the ability to extend through the thoracic spine, uh, how tight you are in other areas, even like uh, the, the lower body, the hips, the lower back, things like that are going to affect the way your shoulders sort of sit and your posture. And the reason why I highlight that is because I do believe, and from personal experience, you can overcome crappy posture, but it takes a long time and it takes a lot of conscious effort and it takes a lot of patience along that process because if you try and force it, you usually end up taking one step forward to take a giant leap backwards. And so what I say to anyone who's trying to improve their overhead mobility that has never had good overhead mobility, if you don't accept that it's going to take years, not months, it's going to take years to get um, overhead mobility. And if you're above the age of 35, like Phil said, you may never achieve as good overhead mobility as someone who achieves a really good overhead mobility. Just to be really precise about what I was saying with the um, graphs of like bone and, and muscle mass, um, like th- those bone changes are very much around bone mineral density. So yep. I'm not like I'm not as 100 percent you know scientifically sure about you know Changing changes posture, in, yeah. in posture. Yeah. So just yeah. be Look, quite unfortunately, clear about that. a lot of physios that you go to, and I've had this myself when I used to have problems, will say no, you can't fix it over after a certain amount of time. I've had a lot of people say 28 years old, and that then that's it, everything's set. I am a massive. I I. I, I have disproven that okay because i had terribly rounded shoulders my tipping point was at 20 age 26 when i really badly damaged a shoulder trying to do acrobatics that my shoulders just weren't capable of doing because of my posture and um that was the point when i started to try and fix it and from 26 until 34 i was working on posture like consciously consciously looking at myself every time i walked in front of a mirror to go crap i'm slouching again i need to strengthen and it was about strengthening everything and and improving the mobility of everything not yeah. just focusing on my chest so this or, is where i really want to like be quite clear with posture is that it's there's kind of two ways of thinking about posture. It's the, you know, look at myself in the mirror and think like, oh, I've got to pull myself up into this, you know, carrot up my butt, um, yep. you know, t- super like upright position, which I think is entirely unhelpful. Like yeah, really. doing that, like there is, it's just not, it, it kind of causes its own problems where now there's this kind of, you know, term in physio where basically you, 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 like hypervigilancy is a real issue in itself. So the hypervigilant about trying to pull yourself into something that your body doesn't want to naturally do is going to start causing kind of like, overuse in Other like areas. structures that aren't kind of used to that yep. and that hypervigilance also breeds this sort of idea of like you know increased threat and increased like um like issues basically where people become scared of bending over they become scared of being in this position and then that makes like that causes all sort of other issues around like being scared of lumbar flexion like down the yep. line so i think this kind of overextender hypervigilancy is really unhelpful and there's been a lot of research into posture and showing that no one posture is necessarily going to cause any issue from being in that position but the thing with posture is that it comes from the balance of the muscular system so if we can you know over that time like you were seeing yourself in the mirror and pulling yourself up straight but at the same time you're also focusing on strengthening your back muscles you're focusing on really you know going from that kind of bodybuilder boxer mindset of being really chest heavy to then building up like strong balanced shoulders that where you're you know you I, over that time you were doing more more work on yeah that's um, right like changing from that boxer sort of 
p- position to yep. being someone who's a- into and and also for that p- period of time I stopped boxing. Yes. I, I literally um, at age thirty I stopped boxing altogether and uh, and just worked on fixing imbalance structural imbalances in my exactly. body. Exactly. So the the change in posture you got was not from seeing yourself in the mirror and pulling yourself into that position. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was yeah. from yeah, yeah. those changes in instruction. I just want to be really clear about that. Yeah. Is that people get really like I, I, funnier? I think the reason why I said I said that is yeah. because I was just trying to reinforce that I was aware yes. of what I was working on. There yep. was focused intent on okay, I'm no longer going to just focus on how good I look in the mirror here and, and, and how hard I can punch like that. Yep. I'm going to start focusing on. So it, I was doing lots and lots of study on, on sh- shoulders and the muscles that support the shoulder. I started to do a lot of trap work, mid, lower, upper trap work. Uh, I did a lot of lower back strengthening. So I did a lot of posterior chain um, contraction, long holds. I got to a point where I could um, um, sit in a Roman chair horizontally with my feet anchored and hold a 20 kilo weight plate in front of me for about 90 seconds, you know, like no joke. crazy yeah. uh, lower back strength. And now if you look at me, I look like I've got a rounded lower back because of the uh, uh, l- lumbar erectors, erector spinae and traps, uh, lats, sorry, that insertion is like hypertrophied to the max, you know, yeah. but I consciously consciously put effort into training that my posterior chain I identified my weaknesses and I put a lot of effort in and it wasn't something that I fixed in a year it took about like realistically four to six years you know and and the thing is I didn't stop doing anything else I just I just was like okay I'm going to build my training around developing the areas that I've sort of neglected in the past, you know, and what the areas that we worked extremely hard on in boxing were our abs and our chest and our anterior portion of the shoulders. Because when we went, I I boxed for like, I was at the gym for 37 hours a week or running outdoors or something specific to boxing. And we didn't do any strength training except push ups, ab crunches and chin ups. That was it. You know, and so for years and years and years, it was just when we did strength work, it was push ups, ab crunches, or pull ups. And your pull-ups probably looked like yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was shocking. I think back, and and I, and guys, I was training with one of Austra- uh, the Australian Olympic coaches. You know, like these guys don't they they train you for boxing and they use um, the old, old school, school methods. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I just want to say for everyone out there, there you can overcome it. I don't care how old you are, you can improve it. You know, you may not end up with perfect posture, but there is no perfect with the human body. It's all exactly. about your perfect, your best effort, your what you can get out of your body, you know? And you just have to embrace that it is going to be a process. And 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 you know, the best thing you can do the best thing you can do is become process oriented with your training, not outcome oriented. You know, in it just start to really enjoy turning up and doing the work and um, and then, you know, celebrate success as you notice them unfold, but don't yeah. hunt for the successes. And, and I think the way to keep that like relevant is when you're doing, um, you know, the, the, again, I keep talking about how much I like the Unity program because it does cover everything so well. And you can just, instead of like subbing out your you know shoulder workout to just do the shoulder rehab program for example or um you can just really you know put a bit more of a focus on certain parts of the program where you know with the um the all the pull like the pulling exercises you just put a bit more of a focus onto that add in some accessory movements with you know maybe some targeted rotator cuff strengthening or axial scapular muscle strengthening like just a few little changes here and there can just keep you enrolled in the kind of fun like program without having to like tap out and be like, I'm in rehab land. Yeah, I'm in, right. <laughs> Guys, I'm on the, this, I'm this on the rehab island. This is literally <laughs> why we spent about 10 years developing the foundations program. Yep. The foundations program is my go-to program to work uh, holistically the entire body to iron out these little imbalances and things like that that might be occurring whilst still just developing overall maximal strength and flexibility. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not about, it's not a rehab program at all. It's a supremely challenging program. But because of the nature of you working unilaterally, there's a high emphasis on uh, 
external rotation in the body, extension and development of the posterior chain, uh, which are the muscles that tend to switch off a little bit when we sit in a chair, you know. Um, yeah, it just works phenomenally well, you know. So just before we finish up, I'd love to get to, I feel like I almost planted Craig Jenkins' um, question here. Uh, oh, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so uh, sorry Aiden. to cut you off. Yep. I'm so sorry to cut you off. I just want to address what Aiden Potts yep. has asked here. Um, Aiden Potts has just basically um, in, invested in a standing desk, uh, which I think is phenomenal. But here's the thing with standing desks. They don't just inherently stop you from slouching. What standing desks do is increase your base caloric expenditure because standing up if you just stand up at a desk as opposed to sit down, you burn on average about two to 300 more calories a day. And that's what they're really phenomenal for, I think. You know, they, because you're working all these little stability muscles that we don't really think about, they all just switch on when we stand up as opposed to sit down. And that little bit of additional muscle contraction throughout the day burns more energy. But Aiden, it doesn't mean that it's gonna just fix your posture. In fact, <laughs> I, I honestly believe that they can be detrimental to your posture because you do fatigue the stability muscles when you're standing all day and you tend to slouch more. You know, I don't know if you've ever watched some like what, what, pay attention to people when they stand at the pub drinking. When you when you get inebriated from alcohol, you relax more and you tend to slouch more or you lean on one leg more yeah. and all these things that can actually then create problems. So sta I, I love standing desks. I love them because one of our biggest problems is our non-exercise energy thermogenesis, which is um, the energy we burn when we're not intent on like intentionally exercising is getting lower and lower and lower because of our sedentary lifestyles. Um, so it fixes that problem, but it certainly doesn't just automatically fix the posture problem, which is what you've talked about in your post here. And so I think as long as you think you think consciously about, you know, we had this thing, this craze about a decade ago where everyone was sitting on fit balls and it was like, sit on a fit ball and it's going to fix all your posture issues. It had the opposite effect. Everyone just slouched more on the fit ball because they're quite hard to sit up straight on, you know? Um, and so like what Phil's saying, uh, the point that Phil made before is spot on, I think, in, in, re in relevance to moving to a stand-up desk there are huge benefits to it but if you're not aware of you know the fact that you are going to be working harder and and those muscles will eventually fatigue and then you're going to slouch and you may end up experiencing a lot of no, doms that's and fatigue where i think like the best use of a standing desk is if you can alternate between standing and Perfect. sitting yep. uh, because you will become fatigued if you stand for a long time and you'll probably end up riding you know sitting on one leg more and riding your itbs or like you know kind of slouching down in different ways which again as i said like no one posture is bad for short term but it's that kind of long-term thing so we want to be adding variety to our body we want to be giving it lots of different stimulus that will you know help keep things balanced and not just become you know kind of stuck in that one position yeah. like you see those old ladies here 100 like because they've sat in, a, in yeah. a chair for years so if you can you know set a timer or you might have like periods where you're like okay this is my sitting period this is my standing period start off with standing and then maybe just for lunch you do an hour of sitting like that's fine sitting is not the enemy like if it if you it's all you do if it's all you do it's the enemy but you know yep. we want that variety in our day so if you can that's yeah. where I think standing desk can the, become 100 percent. the best thing you can possibly do I think is every Every time you break between tasks, which usually you get about 90 minutes of flow on a task, then get up, do a couple of minutes of the squat routine that we teach and try to hang for a couple, like 60 seconds. Just decompress everything, get a little bit of movement going and try to build your lifestyle around a habit of not like sitting at your desk and eating lunch, not sitting at your desk and doing that. Go for a walk outside and pick something up or go and get a little bit of sunlight and eat your desk outside. Just so you're getting a little eat bit more of that. Outside. Heard it not, here first. Yeah, <laughs> non, yeah, that's right. Non-exercise energy thermogenesis, NEAT, N-E-E-T. Um, the more of that little incidental movement that you can create for yourself throughout the day to break up your seating uh, or for Aiden, his standing at the desk is going to be really beneficial. Yeah, love it. Um, just on, yeah, with Craig Jenkins question, I got, it got me excited because I've been, uh, I've been doing a lot of swimming and, and surfing recently and I find like it's a good place for just my mind to like try and figure things out. And I came up with this, uh, sort of analogy for, um, 
or like a little model to think about for uh, ball and socket joints while I was out surfing yesterday. And it doesn't quite work 100%, but I kind of like it. So basically, if you think about... <laughs> so we're going to go um, with it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go it because I have the microphone and I can... <laughs> <laughs> I can do what I want. I do what I want. Um, so this is in ref uh, reply to... Um, is that Craig Dennis? Uh, yeah, it is Craig yep. Dennis. So he said, if you have time to get a question about my shoulder during the shoulder rehab, I'm doing the shoulder rehab, but it's, uh, it just keeps getting so very sore at the front area you discussed about the AC in one of your podcasts, Phil. Um, so what I think he's meaning there is it gets painful in that, that front point here that everyone gets pain when they're doing usually pushing motions, uh, which is that bicep tendon. I've talked before about this um, as it's a really common thing with a dysfunctional shoulder. And so my idea for um, this analogy is basically thinking about your uh, ball and socket joint, so in this case, the shoulder as a bumper car, um, little bumper car arena, where basically you've got muscles that accelerate. And so this, if we think about um, pushing motions, it's our, um, our uh, pecs are the accelerator. So when we want to push in this direction, it's our pecs that are um, pulling everything forward and um, sending things uh, in that direction. Now we've got the rotator cuff, which are the brakes on the on the bumper car. So as you're um, you're speeding up with the pecs, we want to be also putting on the brakes so we don't smash into that that wall um, in the bumper car arena. Or so basically, your rotator cuff is basically trying to slow down the um, movement of that uh, the socket, which is your bumper car, uh, the ball in the socket. And then if you hit up, like if you bump against the the wall, they're the passive structures that are keeping your um, your joint in its place. So in this case, with the um, shoulder joint, we've got the bicep tendon at the front, which is basically um, kind of acting as a physical barrier to uh, stop anterior dislocation. So uh, basically, if you are really like strong on the accelerator but poor on the brakes, then you're just going to be bumping into this wall again and again and again. So that's my kind of analogy. It doesn't quite work, but it, it sort of works. <laughs> but basically, it's this idea that we really need functional brakes. We need our rotator cuff to be working really efficiently, um, and to so we're, that when we're um, you know driving towards that wall, that we can also hit the brakes and, and and stop it before it starts to aggravate those passive structures, or in this case, the um, biceps tendon, and specifically the synovial sheath that covers the tendon and, and reduces friction. So, basically. Um, how to make this better is to be first giving your rotator cuff the best chance to be working efficiently and that comes down to that shoulder posture stuff we've talked about before um, particularly with your axioscapular muscles so as soon as your um, uh, so axioscapular muscles being your um, your muscles that keep your shoulder blades in their sort of ideal place so you want to think about with all the straight arm strength stuff we do is, is big on the rhomboids it's big on the um, serratus anterior all those muscles um, that keep our shoulders nice and stable um, if they work efficiently then our brakes can work efficiently so but then you know you can also then target your rotator cuff muscles and strengthen it up but if you can think about trying to get your shoulders in the best position to start off with as i sort of worked with um aiden on his shoulders was was doing those active hangs that i talked about a bit earlier where you're trying to get that position and then apply all of your upper body movements in that position which is the active hang position so hang onto the bar pull yourself up chest up as if you've got a piece of string pulling your sternum up and draw your shoulders blades back and down um, by pulling your shoulders away from your ears, activating those lower traps. And if you can do your movements in that position, so through the ro shoulder rehab program, if you're doing the trap through raise, you're starting with that position, you're going from there. If you're doing a pulling motion, you're starting in that position and you're pulling. If you're doing a pushing motion, even if it's overhead, uh, if I'm doing a you know military press, I start with that position and then I maintain that contraction while I push. So it's all about trying to build up the ability for the brakes to do their job. Sorry, uh, I have a uh, I have a correction to make, Lee Clements. It's not N E E T. It's N E A T. Non exercise activity thermogenesis that I was talking about, and I've just put a little um, uh, comment in there. Neat. Yeah. All right, guys, that's all we got time for today. We could talk all day, Phil and I. Uh, we enjoy it. We could both talk underwater about anything health and uh, performance related. 
Unfortunately, Richard has to go and do a workout at some point today, and uh, he is like um, he's like Cinderella. <laughs> he's like Cinderella. If we get to nine thirty and he hasn't started a workout, he turns he, into a pumpkin, and he throws the camera at us. <laughs> <and> <laughs> That's literally, literally right. So um, we have to wrap this up, but uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you all for the questions, especially, um, and uh, thanks everyone for listening to the podcast. The podcast is great growing um, at a, a really, really healthy rate. And we love and appreciate all of you. Even though we're now only doing the three episodes a week. The, That's right. Yeah, the Monday, yeah. Tuesday, Friday. Yeah, and that may change eventually, but we'll see how we go. But yeah, we're going we're gonna to just keep pumping this out. We're going to, we got lots, as soon as COVID settles down, we've got lots of really cool guests that are coming on the show. That is actually why we set up uh, a table that can fit four people. Uh, because we want to start bringing guests on, which we're really excited about. And uh, yeah, it's just going to get better and better and better, guys. So big shout out to all the podcast listeners. Big shout out to all of the people watching this replay on YouTube. Thank you. We love you all. And a huge, even bigger shout out to everyone in the UMS Movement Mastermind tribe. Hey, thanks for watching that video. If you liked it, consider subscribing to our channel and make sure you click the notification bell so you know when our weekly videos are uploaded. Now, the best thing for you to do if you wanna stay connected with us and get free online coaching is to join our private Facebook group. It's called the UMS Movement Mastermind and we go live daily where we answer our members' questions. It's very interactive because you can post questions while we're live and we interact with you on the show. You can also upload videos or pictures of yourself with any movements, any stretches, strength training movements, calisthenics, weightlifting, anything that you're struggling with, and we'll critique you, give you feedback, let you know how you can get better. It's a really valuable resource. It allows a lot of communication with us and also our senior tribe members. You'll get answers very, very quickly, and it's absolutely free. So jump on Facebook, search for UMS Movement Mastermind, and join now. Until next time, have a great day.